I would like us to be a lot more passionate about what it is to be human. What is that element of being human? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone always asks about, will robots take over eventually? Yeah. My answer is no, there has to be a human in the loop, right? No, they can. I think they absolutely can. <laughs> <laughs> I've just got a bit nervous here, like, wow, well, jeez. <laughs> Welcome to the Make Tomorrow podcast, where we venture into the heart of innovation and technology. I'm your host, Tristan Sternson, the global co-lead of our NCS Next business. We're going to invite on some very exciting guests onto this show who are going to talk about their Make Tomorrow and how technology and innovation are shaping the world. All right, today we have a very special guest with us. We've got Greg Wood, our global Next Head of Digital Experience here to talk with us about making tomorrow human. So welcome to the show, Greg. Thank you so much. To get us started, how do you unwind in the constantly connected world of technology? Geez, that's a good question. Straight in, like digital company. We don't mess around. We yep. want to go straight into the guts yep. of it. We're yep. talking about technology yep. and going straight away from technology. Yep. Good yep. stuff. <laughs> okay. That's a really good question, right? As a human being living in this incredibly complex, highly tech, technological world, yep. um, it's hard. Right? It's really, really hard to switch off to unwind. Uh, for me, a lot of people already know this, but what I do is I jump on my bike and I hit the trails. So mountain biking is my thing. Yep. Uh, I used to do a lot of road riding. Road riding is very meditative. Mountain biking is you haven't got time to think. And that's where I go as, as quickly and as and urgently as I can and just kind of shut off all the thinking stuff that goes on and go back to instinct. So let's flip from really non-technical. Cool to everything in the technology world moves in 10 years, right? 10 years ago, yeah. we were barely using mobile apps. It's astonishing. Yeah. If you crystal ball, mm. right? We've got one here today, yep. in the future, make tomorrow. Okay. Where are we heading in the next 10 years? If there was something in 10 <laughs> years time that we haven't seen yet, where would we go? Something in 10 years time. Now I'm gonna go back about 10 years okay. first and say, I remember driving around in Auckland with small kids in the back seat and talking to my darling wife and saying, you know, our kids are just gonna to talk to their computers. And you know, she kind of scoffed, went, nah, it's all gonna be typing still. So no, and here we are, right? Yep. Yep, so it's not like I'm super prescient or anything, but it was just kind of, oh my God, look at the way this thing is moving. Do you reckon in 10 years time, yeah. you won't be driving the car? That's a good question. I think 10 years time, a lot of very, very assisted driving will happen. Right? Yep. So we talk about, you know, everything at the moment is augmented reality, all that sort of stuff. We're talking about augmented humans. Yep. We can talk about this a bit later, but where do we stop being human and just be fully hands off and go, there's no fun anymore. Let's go back to the human, right? Yeah, okay. The essence of it. I have so many people talking about, when will robots replace humans? Like, what is yeah. the problem? And I talk about the human in the loop, right? Yep. So let's talk a little bit about the human. So human-centered design, right? We're making tomorrow more human, yep. right? We've got technology. Your kids are going to be talking to the technology, yep. right? Or thinking to it. Yeah. So, so where do we start from the design element? Do we, do we have to be thinking that way or do we have to be thinking about designing technology for robots? Holy crap. Designing technology for robots. I mean, one of the most astonishing things that I've watched happening is this idea of uh, training robots in virtual worlds. Yep. All right. So uh, human time is kind of linear and quite slow and it's very hard to, to scale or multiply it. When I first heard of the fact that we could build a digital twin of something and then put the robot's brain inside the digital twin and then send it running yep. and have it practice 10 billion different combinations of permutations of serving a dish in a cafe and then bring it back mm -hmm. in a very short amount of time and suddenly it's fully trained. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that was when things started getting freaky. So yeah, designing for robots versus designing for humans. I think in terms of make tomorrow human, I would like us to be a lot more passionate about what it is to be human. Yep. All right. Yeah, let's get the robots doing the things that are not fun or easily repeated. And let's unleash the people into what's lovely, right? So, so what is that? So what, what is that element of being human? Like, what, what do yeah. we need to look for? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. For long pause while I think about what it is to yeah. be human. So, so the one thing, like I've had a lot of people talking about 
and we've just come off obviously the impact conference yes, for, for NCS fantastic. and um, yeah, what that. an amazing conference, right? 1500 people, two days, internal, external, yep. awesome, right? Yep. And one of the things that I really loved that someone talked about was when you're designing um, a lot of these artificial intelligence solutions, yeah. they're really to aid and assist people, Yes. right? Yeah. As opposed to replace people. Yeah. So if I think of aid and assist, Let's, let's wind that back to being human. So yeah. the design elements of that, where, where do we start? So, where, yep, I mean, you know, we have frameworks and techniques yep. and tools and this sort of thing. NCS Drive is a great design yep. thinking framework. You know, yep. discover, reframe, yep. ideate, visualize, and, and then... Yeah. But you start with the user. Yep. Right? You start with people first. And I, I like to say, you know, talking about this at Impact yesterday with all of our, our clients and partners, right, NCS... We can build anything, mm -hmm. maybe apart from a time machine, but working on that, we can build anything. But what should we build? All right, so certainly you can solve some business problems really quickly, but mm -hmm. go to the user first, right? And listen very, very carefully as to what their frustrations are and what's stopping them having a wonderful time being human, spending time with their family, achieving their goals, whatever. Yep. And then look for the technology and where can we support that experience yep. from there, right? So where can we do that? So let's, let's go to some, maybe some examples. I don't know what we can and can't talk yeah, about. So, yeah. so just say, no, you can't talk about yeah. that. If I, if I ask you about some clients that we can't talk about, but yeah. you did an amazing pop-up book last year, mm, right? Lovely, yeah. Are we allowed to talk about that? Yeah, totally. Oh, yep. It's one of my favorite technology yeah, okay. projects. And talking about being human, that's yeah, awesome. So yeah. tell, tell us a little bit about that. Oh, so, okay. Gardens by the Bay here in yep. Singapore. Um, a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, the world's most Instagrammed garden. Yep. Uh, so during the COVID years. Yep. Uh, people couldn't come and visit the gardens. Yep. So our challenge working with the gardens crew was how do we take the gardens out into the world? All right, and sure, video is one really fabulous way to do it. But in terms of depth of storytelling, and depth of experience, we suggested perhaps there was a way we could augment a book. Mm -hmm. But some of the things we did was not just purely, and this is beautiful stuff as well, um, showing how a plant grows mm -hmm. right? or plant your own tree on top of the book in an augmented way but allowing people to actually step into the book, which was quite an astonishing kind of next level. Was approach. there a, like you walked across a bridge? Yeah, and you so, uh, so what we did uh, within the, the experiential app, you can cast a portal, yep. all right? And you can walk out onto the sky. Mm -hmm. It's quite extraordinary to be in your own home or in the studio here and yep. walk out onto a 40 meter high platform. Yeah, wow. And you're in instantly immersed. And what we love watching is people who do this and, and they, they look around and they go, oh my God, I'm here. And then they look back and they can see back through the portal and see people waving at them <laughs> from wow. within their lounge room. And it's, it's a completely almost trippy or, or a, astonishing experience to be transported through that's, the portal. It's such a good example of the human element yeah, of it. Because if yeah. I think, if you go back 10 years, yeah. it'd be more like a computer game, right? You look yep. forward, but... You wouldn't think of the elements of people waving at it, making yeah. it more realistic. Um, yeah. Another really cool one, you remember from last year when we did this yep. in the next launch, yes. um, we had Iris. Do you remember Iris? I remember Iris, yep. yeah. And um, the, our artificial intelligence, what do yep. we call her, our chief technology officer. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. that was so cool. And actually, I think that, I'm not sure if that came out of a Kiwi company as well or somewhere, but yep. it was... It was the facial expression. So yeah. talk a little bit about like how we need to make these things like actual yeah, people. Look, um, there, there are two sides to this. I think the, the biggest challenge is um, humans are un just unbelievably hardwired to respond to faces. Right? Yep. It's just millions of years of, of, of response. So we're very highly cued to spot when something's not right. Yep. Astonishingly so, right? And we can just pick up on any micro, micro um, piece of facial movement or whatever. So that good old uncanny valley that we talk about, yeah. when you know, if you have a robot, you know it's a robot and everyone's happy. Yeah. When you have a human, you know it's a human, everyone's happy. And somewhere in between, it gets very unhappy. It's like not quite human, we don't like it at all, right? It makes us feel queasy. Um, so we've got a responsibility to try and design virtual interactive humans in a way that avoids that uncanny valley. So either side is fine, all right, but not in it. At the same time, we've got a bigger responsibility to say when that virtual human is virtual. So one of the demos you had at Impact, which yeah. just blew my mind. I, I know we can't, I'm not sure we can talk about the customer here, but yeah. 
we were interacting with a piece of art, yep. right? And you were physically talking to it and um, with your voice, I think it was. Yep. yep. And, um, and it had personality, like yeah. real personality. Yeah, so it wasn't yeah. just a straight answer back. So how important is that in technology to make things really human? Right. So we're talking about uh, personality in terms of, of humans, in terms of interaction. All right. And so, of course, whenever we design any kind of interface, it will have uh, some version of personality. All right? mm -hmm. So rounded corners on buttons versus square corners, that sort of detail can be you know, quite helpful in, in terms of giving you a message about whether this is a fun thing to do or whether this is a very st structured thing to do, right? When we get to more human interaction like voice, right, or, or nodding and waving and that sort of thing, personality has a huge effect. Yep. Uh, and the difficulty is how do you train and manage a personality so that it doesn't become annoying? Yep. All right. So too friendly is annoying. Yeah. Too structured is annoying. And humans are great at flexing. Yep. Right. Within that space. Computers less so. So we've got a, a lot of work to do in terms of understanding intent on the behalf of the human um, and understanding uh, what people actually mean. One of my favorite old jokes about computers is they can't tell the difference between I feel like an idiot and I feel like a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of, of warm and friendly interactions, yep. one of my favorite things we've done here at NCS is the piece of work, uh, Insight, the, the listening platform, right? transcription platform. Uh, and it, it listens in perfect Singlish. Yeah, wow. Which is astonishing. Singlish is such a wonderful, rich kind of uh, Creole language, right? And it just changes all the time. And you watch the Teams transcription and our Insight transcription, and Teams is nowhere near it. It's amazing. So, um, and I've seen it, and yeah. I think it's cool. And, and how long have you lived in Singapore now? Ten years? Uh, it's off and on about ten years, yeah. Ten years, right. So, yeah. so as a human, you've had to learn Singlish, yep. right? I've, I've been doing it for about a year, and I'm kind <laughs> of getting it. Can, right? Can. Can that. Um, so I'm learning my Singlish. So, yeah. I mean, is that, I know that's something Google hadn't even done as a, as a language thing. I know we did it with Singtel. Is it, yep. It's been widely adopted. Have, you, have we seen it in a yeah. lot of interactions? And um, we, it's something that our clients absolutely love. Yep. And both for a sense of ownership and a sense of belonging, yep. but also as a technical demonstration, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I, I, absolutely, I was blown away with it. And um, let's get into you a bit more. Yeah, okay. A bit, bit more about Greg, right? The designer. Oh, I mean, you, yep. you, you, no, yeah. you, you're a true designer. Like you've been doing it for a long time and, and you've grown your role here. Um, what aspect gets you most excited about you know, the human center of design or design wow. itself? I'm driven by my family, right? Yep. And I think about my, my, my darling mum, who's um, just a, a wonderful person and the frustration that she faces when she interacts with anything. So, <laughs> so no, that's actually yeah. a really good point. Like, let's, let's keep going with that because yep. one of my key areas that mm. I love is accessible technology to everyone. Yep. So if we're gonna make tomorrow human, yep. right? It's like you and I can use tech, right? And, yep. and you know, our teams can use tech. My kids can use tech better than I can use tech, right? And, yeah, and that's yeah, yeah. you know how they're growing up. And yeah. your kids, as you said, will be talking to tech later <laughs> in life. But yeah. you know, your mum, my mum, how yeah. do we design tech for them? Oh man, I love this aspect. And one of the things I'm I'm such a fan of with the, our Australian crew is the depth that um, the designers have gone to in terms of accessibility training yeah. and, and and conceptualizing situations. And one of the demos again that was at Impact yesterday, uh, Selmia and the the virtual reality train station yeah. as a, a demo of how you can build a space for anyone to come into and explore and we can watch this exploration without actually having to go down to the train station and put people you know, at the, um, under pressure and we can take anyone into that situation yeah. and what I'm, <laughs> what I'm really keen to do is take someone who is, uh, has sight troubles into that VR world. Yeah, wow. All yeah. right. I was in LA last week and I bumped into Dylan Alcott, right? Okay. And uh, he was the Australian of the Year. He's a yep. he's, he's paraplegic. Um, he's won many Grand Slams. He's won a gold medal in the Olympics um, in basketball. Amazing, inspirational person. We did some work with him on a thing called Get Skilled Access in yes. Australia, right? I remember this one. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Which is yeah. all around jobs for people with different accessibility and stuff. But the applications that we had to build yeah. had to be able to be used by everyone. It doesn't matter if it's sight, vision or hearing yeah. or anything like that. Like technology is an enabler, right? In, yeah. in, in the, being human, it, to, 
actually oh, make everyone, yeah. bring everyone onto the same platform yeah. to some extent, right? Yes, so technology as an enabler. And um, yep. there's a couple of things there. One thing is I love the work that Microsoft has done in terms of, of temporary disenablement. All right, so... Temporary um, disenablement. Yeah. So we, we look at if you're going to design for someone who is, uh, has accessibility issues, yep. you're actually going to solve the problem for people who are temporarily in that state. Yeah, wow. Okay. So if you design for someone who's profoundly deaf, yep. you're actually also designing for a bartender. In yeah. a club, right? <laughs> okay. If you design for someone who has lost the use of one of their arms, you're also designing for a parent with a newborn. Yeah, yeah. okay. All right, designing for someone in a wheelchair, you're designing for a, um, a parent with a two-year-old in a pushchair. Yeah. Yeah, so designing for everyone is such a great unleash of why we should look after each other all the time. Um, but the other thing that I just remembered, I got an email yesterday from a company called Be My Eyes who were updating me about their terms of, of use, and I'd completely forgotten about them. They were the first app that I downloaded on my first iPhone. <laughs> right. And it's a way for people with sight difficulties to throw a call out to the internet and say, I need to take this medication, I can't read the label, can someone help me? Yeah. And that for me was a big turning point in, in my career from you know, advertising message making to Oh my God, design and technology solves problems for people. Do you remember those old web readers, right? So that was yeah. the first I came across and there's, we've got an amazing team in Australia that have done this yeah. stuff. And, and they were demonstrating it to me and it was a web reader and it was like, welcome to our website and blah, blah, blah. And it read through every word yeah. of the page and not in the right order and stuff. And I'm like, yeah. shit, how long does that take someone to actually get through a page, right? Yeah. And now yeah. I look at it today and it's like, wow. Like you, like you don't even have to tell an app that you've got a hearing a disability or a sight or anything like that. Yeah. The fact that you've chosen that on your iPhone or your Android device, yeah. your app just automatically flips into it, right? Yeah. But you have to design purposely for that, don't you? Yeah, you do, yeah. Yep. So purposeful design, um, I think we should delineate art from design. Yep. All right, so, uh, and a lot of, gonna be <laughs> critical and perhaps put some people on the spot. A lot of interface design skews in the direction of sort of art or just output. Yeah. All right. And it's quite easy to do. There's lots of tools and you can make something look like it works. Yeah. But design is intentionally solving a problem using some kind of creative output. So we just naturally think, yeah. Greg, you're a designer, so yeah. I need something really beautiful designed. I'm going to come yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what you're really saying is that the design doesn't have to be beautiful. It has to be useful. Yeah. We talk about make tomorrow human. Yeah. That's it, right? Like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. And maybe I can't even differentiate what's beautiful or not, right? Yeah. Because different people and different sites will have different yeah. ideas of things. Yeah, and I think um, inherently something that is useful will, will have a feeling of beauty about it. Yeah, wow. And you just kind of, oh, it just works. It feels lovely. Yeah. Something that is beautiful but not useful is also nice to have around. <laughs> yeah. Right? And that's art and that's also what makes us human. I'm trying to remember back, there was a website it was a terribly, like, it looked ugly. Yeah. But it was so useful, right? It was just right. so easy to get to the things. And it's like, yeah. wow. But I think, I think a lot of that just comes naturally now. Yeah. But, but you have to well, be actually, purposeful. I'm going to argue with you for a second yeah. about that. So uh, if you look, one of my most astonishing moments for me as a human was leaving New Zealand for the first time to work overseas yeah. and work here in Singapore. And the, the very short story goes, as a good Kiwi, our culture is at 5 o'clock on a Friday, if you've just started the job, you bring the beers. You bring right. the beers you bring yourself. The beers. Okay. Yep. 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 It's a, like my honorific kind of yep. gift to the culture is we're all going to have a beer on, yep. on Greg. So I turn up in Singapore and I start my first job in Singapore and I bring the beers up on Friday and I put them on the studio table and the room goes quiet. I'm like, what's going on? This is what I'm doing. Someone takes me aside and says, it's uh, Ramadan. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. And I was like, I yep. had not heard of Ramadan. Yep. Yep. But where I'm going with that is in terms of culture and the way things are designed, um, if you look at a Japanese website yep. versus a Singaporean website or a Thai website, quite a different flavor. Yep. Yep. In terms of the comfort with the density of information and the way people want to interact with it, all that sort of thing. So that's interesting. So we yeah. are a global business, 12,000 yeah. people yeah. across Asia Pacific. Um, we like to think we're all the same, right? Like, so I yeah. look at it, Singapore, Australia are two biggest markets. Yeah. And um, 
they're so different, right? Yeah. We share designers across the space and stuff like that. So if I'm building something in Australia or Singapore, I mean, we talked about Singlish, right? Yeah, yeah. We have to consider the differences, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so let's jump back to Singapore, right? Yeah. I've heard the term silver tsunami a fair bit. So, okay, yeah. Do we, is that a strong consideration when you're building mm. technology over here? Yeah, it really is, right? And, and it's not simply just, uh, let's make the, all the type sizes a little bit bigger for yep. older eyes. We talked about robots earlier on, the kind of support replacement augmentation technologies that we're going to need to actually bring in. Yep. So um, the, the most immediate piece of technology that people think of when they think of designers, of course, is websites and apps and that sort of thing. Yep. Um, but in terms of the design of uh, robot assistants, but also the design of the accessibility of uh, medical checking devices, like yeah, blood okay. pressure. Uh, things like we're going to need a lot more day nurses. Yep. Okay. So if we go right to the re real end of the silver tsunami when people are um, perhaps incapable of, of leaping out of bed and engaging in the, in the world, we need a lot more day nurses. Yep. Can we design robots to take some of that pressure off the people so that the people can do the interaction. That's actually really cool. So yeah. I was thinking when I asked the question, yep. we're talking about how can people use technology, yeah. but you're actually talking about how we can be human by enabling people to live better yeah. with technology, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Wow, that's really powerful. So we can have, I mean, we see it like at the simplest level, you go into a restaurant and yeah. there's a robot that picks up your plates, yeah. right? Yeah. I saw something a couple of years ago that was really cool, which was um, motion sensors under carpet for old age homes. Oh, yeah. So you know cool. someone's not moving around and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so, so that's a design because you put it under the carpet, it's not yeah. obtrusive as yeah. opposed to a camera. As opposed right? to a camera, right? Yeah. yeah. Have you seen anything else that's really cool in that space that, that you can think of? Um, it's unobtrusive design. Well, why not, actually, I want to talk about robots and the tray picking up robots. Yep. One of my issues and something that we're pushing the team to start engaging with is how do you know how to deal with a robot? Yeah, right? okay. So if you observe a restaurant and the tray robot comes past, and I've got my, my plate, is this a game, right? And I, um, do I have to is this slot it in right as or, it comes Or is past? it chicken? Is Who's going to move? Yeah, Who's going to move chicken? first? Is it chicken? Is it kind of a version <laughs> of Frogger where I have to kind of slot it <laughs> in as it comes past or yeah. what? And if it comes too close to me, can I shove it away? Yeah. All right. It goes back to things like with dogs, we typically understand what's an angry dog and what's a friendly dog and we can push it away. Yeah. Right. With robots, we, we don't know. Yeah. Okay. So, that, so that's really cool. So how we interact with it, I yeah. think it's really important. I think you know, building technology to yeah. assist the aging community, I mean, that's awesome because you're right, the, the strain on healthcare and, and stuff like that. But let's go down the path of everyone always asks about will robots take over eventually? Yeah, My yeah. answer is no, there has to be a human in the loop, right? And we kind of kind of do it. Like I feel there's always going to be a plug someone can pull. Yeah. What do you think? Is there, can, can robots take over the world? Is there yeah, a plug? They, no, they can. I think they absolutely can. My um, touchstone and optimism and hope for the future is closely related to Ian M. Banks' sci-fi books in the culture world, mm -hmm. where of course the computers have become so much more intelligent than humans. Uh, they don't treat the humans as pets per se, but they just let the humans be human. Yeah, right. Yep. But so, it, yeah. so you're saying that robots will take over the world, but let us do what we want to do. Yeah. Without taking us captive as their slaves. So if we want to go fully sci-fi on it and the idea of multiple futures, yeah, all right, and decision points, I'm just projecting down the one that I like to look at. <laughs> okay. Uh, it is scary. I yep. think it is scary. Um, the, the you know the outcomes that people talk about in terms of if you optimize a an AI or, or, or a, um, something for its particular job and you forget to tell it to allow for other conditions it mm -hmm. will drive down that, yeah. that ro road and it will just keep going and that can have really poor outcomes yeah so um, in terms of design right we talk about everyone needs to design not just the designers but you need to design, you need to think about what the outcomes are yep. and what you want to achieve. Yeah, and know where the end yeah. is to some extent as well. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Oof. Oof. <laughs> I've just got a bit nervous <laughs> here. Like, wow, geez. I'm an optimist. My glass is always half full, yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. And, and that's amazing. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question because yeah, we could sure. talk all day on this, right? Absolutely. And, and like, I, I just feel 
technology yeah. and the human element of it. Like yeah. people forget about that, right? Like yeah. we build technology for humans, right? If there's one piece of advice you can give people out there who are designing technology, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, whether it's internal to us or external to anyone, right? Yeah. What's the one thing you, what's the first thing you tell people when you're kind of mentoring or you're guiding people through oh, design wow. around, around the human element of tech? Like what, what's something you, you'd give us as advice? Yeah. Um, it's an interesting one. I, my first answer was going to be go back to that. What should you build? All right. So we can build anything. What should you build? Right? Just because you can doesn't mean you, you should. But actually the, the slightly more considered answer I wanted to give was show what you're designing to another human. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The tools we've got today means we can get a long way real fast, whereas we kind of used to work in you know, atelier yeah. or, or in, a, in a group. And so you can get yourself in a lot of trouble really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so early on, like I, I love helping my team learn how to do scribbles and get crap up on the wall and, and make mistakes early. Yeah. Right, and get other people to come in and just kind of go, what if, what if, what if? Yeah. So I think that's where we should go. More humans involved in making the digital stuff really good so yep. that it sets us free to be more human so we make tomorrow human yep by showing it to more humans yeah wow That's, sounds easy what a conversation <laughs> so look thanks greg for coming on um you know i, I know we could talk for hours on this stuff yep. and I, I love talking to you about it. Uh, design for me is kind of it's it's the starting point of any tech yeah. right yeah um and uh and, and it's really interesting to have your comments on it I'm less nervous about the robots taking over the world, so Good. I'll keep my glass full on that. But yeah. um, it's been an amazing conversation. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming on and sharing yeah. with us. And um, and I'm sure as we walk out of here today, yeah. you and I are going to be talking a lot yeah, more yeah, about yeah, this yeah. sort of stuff. So yeah. thank you, Greg, our uh, global <laughs> next head of digital experience, which is everything design through to, yep. to digital um, experience solutions. So great conversation on making right. tomorrow human. Thank you. If you found today's episode interesting and want to hear more about our Make Tomorrows, please subscribe to our channel.